Değerli izleyiciler, herkese iyi akşamlar. Bugün 21 Şubat her pazar saat 2 civarı yapmaya çalışıyorum e, bir webinar. Fakat bu sefer e, bu saate e, rast geldi. Şimdi neden olduğunu açıklayacağım size. E, dolayısıyla öncelikle size e, iyi akşamlar e, dilemek istiyorum. Güzel bir hafta sonu e, geçirmişizdir. Şimdi e, bugün neden e, akşam saat 8'de e, yayınlıyoruz bunu? E, şu yüzden e, bugünkü e, konuyu konuşacağımız e, konuğum yurt dışından Amerika'dan bağlanıyor. E, sağ olsun beni kırmadı. E, bu konuda zaten bir webinar yapmak istiyordum. E, önemli bir konu çünkü gerçekten. E, kendisi de kabul etti eksik olmasın. E, dolayısıyla biz de bugünü e, bu konuya ayıralım istedik. Evet bugün konumuz e, değerli izleyiciler enerji. Enerji kaynakları, sürdürülebilir enerji, yenilenebilir enerji, sustainable veya e, renewable dediğimiz yenilenebilir enerji üzerinde. E, tabii enerji derken biz teknolojist e, tarafındayız. E, bunu da özellikle e, vurgulamak istiyorum. İşin teknoloji tarafıyla ilgili e, neler yapılabilir, dünya nerede, Türkiye ne yapabilir, kaynaklar tükenmekte çünkü Notlarıma bakıyorum biliyorsunuz e, yani enerji elektrik hayatımızda çok çok önemli. E, hayat kalitemizde çok önemli. Yenilebilir enerji var, tüketilebilir, tüketilen enerji var. E, tüketilen enerji hangisi, yenilenemeyen enerji hangisi? Bildiğiniz gibi doğalgaz, petrol, kömür gibi e, kaynaklar e, sürdürülemeyen. Ee, ve tüketilen e, enerji kaynakları ve son derece e, ekonomimizin büyük parçası e, onlara ayrılıyor, bütçenin büyük parçası. E, her şey çünkü elektrikli enerjiyle çalışıyor bildiğiniz gibi ve büyük bir ekonomi gidiyor. Halbuki e, bu kadar güzel doğal kaynaklar var yani özellikle ülkemizde. E, örneğin e, rüzgar, örneğin güneş, e, su, dağa. Ee, ve e, jeotermik e, mesela bunlardan e, faydalanılabilerek e, enerji neden e, üretilmesin ve neden sürdürülebilirce e, kullanmayalım. E, Dünya Enerji Konseyi Türk Milli Komitesi'nin enerji raporuna göre fosil kaynakların 2040 yılında e, tükenme eğilimi e, göstereceği belirtilmektedir. Çok ciddi bir durum. Yani yaklaşık 30 yıldan daha az bir süre e, kalmıştır. O zaman 2040 yılında yeni yatırımlar, 2040 yılına kadar yeni yatırımlar e, yapılmalı. Yeni senaryolar e, geliştirilmeli ki e, böylece e, eğer e, bu tip e, kaynaklar tüketilecekse ki insan sayısı nüfusu da e, artmaktaydı kendimize yeni kaynaklar bulmalıyız. Şimdi ben sözü fazla uzatmadan e, konuğumu davet etmek e, istiyorum. Kendisi Amerika'da e, Portland State Üniversitesi e, öğretim üyesi, e, değerli Profesör Doktor Tuğrul e, Dayım hocamı e, sahneye davet etmek e, istiyorum ve tekrar teşekkür ediyorum e, katıldığı için. Öncelikle nasılsınız? İyiyim, çok teşekkür ederim. Siz nasılsınız? Teşekkür ederim. Hocam bugün ee, söz sizde. Ben açılışı yaptım. Öncelikle e, sizin gibi e, değerli hocalar, her zaman, ya herkes e, değerli, her e, arkadaşımız, meslektaşımız e, öyle ama e, sizin kısa bir kariyer yolculuğunuzu almak istiyorum örnek olması açısından. Mümkünse birkaç cümlede, tek bir cümle değil de birkaç cümlede kariyer yolculuğunuzu alarak daha sonra sunumunuza geçsek çok çok iyi olacak diye düşünüyorum. Olur tabii. Ben e, bundan sonra sunumumu İngilizce yapmak istiyorum. Çünkü e, 30 yıl burada İngilizce olarak çalışınca e, Türkçe sunmaya e, bile çalışmak, yani onu denemek bile istemiyorum. Haklısınız. O yüzden beni affedersiniz. O yüzden İngilizce başlıyorum. Eğer müsaade ederseniz. Lütfen buyurun. So good morning, uh, good evening. So wherever you are, uh, you're out there in the world. Uh, so thank you again for inviting me to to this forum. Uh, just a little bit on my background. Uh, so I uh, was born in Turkey uh, and went to school there. Uh, I 
graduated from uh, Boğaziçi University, uh, or its uh, very original name, uh, Robert College. Uh, in 1989, uh, I got the mechanical engineering degree. Uh, and then I came to United States uh, uh, with a uh, funding from, uh, at the time, uh, Turkish Education Foundation and Turkish uh, uh, Turk Petrol Foundation. And I studied at uh, Lehigh University. Again, I studied uh, mechanical engineering then, uh, focusing on really at the time computer-aided design and robotics. Uh, but I always wanted to uh, have or learn about managing engineering and technology as well. Uh, and I was seeking for a master's program. And then I met uh, Professor Danda uh, or Dunda Kocaoğlu. Uh, here in English, we call him Danda Kocaoğlu. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, he convinced me to basically do my PhD. He also actually graduated from Robert College uh, and then from Lehigh University, uh, of course, uh, uh, several decades before I did. Uh, uh, but he convinced me to come to Portland and work with him. And, uh, and I did. Uh, I came. Uh, and I'm glad I did it because I learned a lot from him. Uh, while I was working on my PhD, uh, I started working at Intel Corporation. I, I, I started developing courses and teach, and then I got my degree. I continued working at Intel, also uh, teaching. Uh, I was at Intel for over 10 years. Uh, I did several things. I started as a program manager uh, in the manufacturing of uh, printed circuit boards. At the time, actually, this is 1995, Intel was uh, world's largest motherboard uh, manufacturer. Uh, and then uh, I uh, started, I switched to uh, labs, R&D labs. Uh, and there I worked, uh, basically I managed technology development as well as university technology transfer. Uh, and then last three years at Intel, I managed product development, uh, specifically uh, processes for servers. So those were the first really the pioneering processors for the cloud at the time. Uh, and uh, later on, I uh, there was an opportunity and I took the opportunity to come back to the university and start and, and continued my academic career as a full-time uh, faculty. Uh, and uh, today uh, I will present uh, about 15 years of work uh, which we did with uh, Bonneville Power Administration, which mm -hmm. is a which is a part of U.S. Department of Energy. So, after coming to university in 2005 as a full-time faculty, we immediately started working with the U.S. Department of Energy mm -hmm. and ha helped them. Really, at the time, Obama administration uh, came uh, soon after that, and there was a lot of interest uh, in renewable energy. And, and there were challenges, uh, challenges in terms of integrating these technologies because the existing infrastructure didn't really, uh, wasn't easy to, to incorporate these new technologies. So uh, they wanted to understand how they evaluate technologies, plan for it. So we helped them uh, with evaluating and road mapping technologies. So that, that was a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's enough then. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it was a nice uh, introduction. Thank you for it. And if you like, uh, because time is quite limited, so let's go to your presentation with a pleasure. Stage is yours, Hoca. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, today's work is, I mean, today's presentation is based on our uh, work with uh, Barnaval and U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, wh wh while I said it's 15 years, actually, it's uh, it's the the... The worth of uh, its worth is more than a century. Why I say century? Because we have, I'm going to present the dissertations of my students who mm -hmm. work on, on these projects. And each project lasts about uh, five to six years. There are several people. And of course, this is also based on the methodologies that uh, Dr. Kokagwa had uh, uh, developed. So you, you're going to be uh, seeing and hearing about a century 
uh, long work here. Lovely. Uh, you are the main yeah. main page. You know, you this is your covered page now. Yeah, Sustainable yeah, energy technologies. Yeah, your cover page. Yes, I'm talking about mm -hmm. it now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, just a brief note to so to do, to those who are listening. I'm also the editor in chief of IEEE Transactions on Engineering Management. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's the top uh, journal in our field. Uh, so those who are listening uh, and doing research in these areas, so your work is welcome in our journal. Yeah, now, this is your announcement then. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start with a, a story uh, to really give you the uh, understanding of what we mean uh, when we are when we talk about sustainable uh, energy technologies and and evaluating them. Mm -hmm. So it's the uh, story of uh, salmon and and wind in the Northwest US. So Northwest US is really where I live. That's where uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho is. And one of the uh, unique uh, properties of this area is the water we have. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. a, I mean, there we have the most water in the U.S. because of the Columbia River, mm -hmm. and and uh, because of the uh, water we have, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, how would I say, uh, interesting species living. Uh, one of them is salmon, wild salmon. So the, we we are actually very privileged to have and uh, and enjoy uh, salmon here. Now, uh, of course, the energy and the fish don't get along well. Uh, and the uh, the Columbia River has many many dams, and dams, of course, uh, kill the fish. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's a it's a big challenge. And in addition to just the environmental aspects, there is also uh, social aspects. We have several uh, uh, Native American tribes living in the region, and salmon is very important to them uh, for, their, uh, for their life. So the, uh, the, the part of the energy department here, which is Vulnerable Power Administration, is managing uh, the country's largest wildlife program so you might be surprised how can a uh, an energy company especially a, a power utility uh, is managing the largest wildlife program so uh, it is uh, they are doing it because it's a part of uh, the um, the let's say the uh, the scene uh, so energy is not just technical it's got it's uh, as you can say environmental and social aspects now, hmm. while they understand that it's, it's uh, I mean, there are all these uh, factors, they, uh, we still make mistakes. Now, here is what we did uh, with respect to wind energy in the Northwest. So we, um, about uh, 15 years or so ago, there was a big ramp of wind energy here in the Northwest. And we uh, called everyone, including foreign companies, to come and build wind farms and in return, we told them that we guarantee the sales of their of any of the energy any amount of energy they produce. Of course, while giving that uh, promise, we forget about salmon and the water. Uh, you could you you may ask why. Well, here's the reason. Uh, so we, uh, in addition to our rivers, we have uh, we, we live in a uh, we live in this area of Cascades, Cascade Mountains. And we have a lot of mountains and mm -hmm. uh, snowy mountains, of course. And in spring time, uh, coming close, and then uh, beginning of summer, there's so much uh, water coming down, and all the dams, as a result, are full. Now, you could basically just flow, let the water flow over, but we cannot do that because we have, then we would kill the fish, the salmon. So there has been a lot of investment in developing passages for the fish. So that, so that the fish can pass through, and uh, so we let we but letting the uh, water through the dam means we also have to generate uh, the power. So during that time, we generate 
power through our hydro dams, and there is more than enough. So we tell the wind farmers to stop. Now, but we still pay them for energy that they never produce because we had agreements. So we pay U.S. tax dollars money, or used to, uh, to Spanish companies for the energy that they, they never produce. So, of course, we didn't really intend to do that, or the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the government, but when you are making uh, agreements without understanding these, understanding these multiple perspectives, you make mistakes. So that's why today I'm going to talk about how we can evaluate these technologies through multiple perspectives. So Dr. Kokoglu and I started an institute uh, looking at these uh, technologies through multiple perspectives, as you can see on the picture here. And this is really based on a methodology called hierarchical decision modeling. I'm not get, uh, get, going to get into the mathematics of this. You could always contact me. But the idea is we go through the uh, through working with experts, uh, quantifying their judgments, uh, and and identify the weights of every perspective and the criterion, and then calculate the technology values uh, with respect to these uh, criteria uh, using value curves, which basically tells us, uh, I mean, what the value. Uh, of that criterion uh, uh, or the metric for us for that technology. And then when we combine them, we have a technology value. Now I'm going to go through some examples so that you could understand what the I mean. Now, this one really looked at uh, energy efficiency programs, the first one, funded by many uh, sources. Um, one of my former students worked on it, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Ishkin. Uh, and uh, what we did was we looked at uh, energy efficiency programs. Now, what is an energy efficiency program? So, as I mentioned, when we, uh, I mean, we could have different energy sources or energy plants, right? You could have a wind farm, hydroelectric dam, nuclear, whatnot, but you could also implement energy efficiency programs, reducing the demand so that you don't have to build a plant. And what are those? For example, uh, LED lights or uh, heat pump water heaters. Uh, so these uh, technologies accompanied by marketing programs developed by these agencies uh, disseminate through the market. People adopt these technologies, and as a result, we see a decrease in the uh, in the power demand. So by just uh, working with the experts, uh, quantifying their judgments, we identified that really, when you look at the, this, the benefits of like technical benefits are as important as the uh, ability to develop uh, programs and, and have the technologies acquired by the market. So meaning, it doesn't matter if you develop the technology, if there aren't, there aren't any marketing programs, uh, then or or uh, standards measuring, uh, providing uh, standard measures, the you will never realize the benefits. And then we may then uh, value basically use this model to evaluate technologies and identify which technologies are uh, better for the region. Now, we could actually use this program to look at different scenarios. So as you can see, there are weights at the top. So those are regional priorities, really. So if you go to from, from northwest U.S. to southwest uh, U.S. Uh, or southeast U.S., the priorities uh, will change drastically. Or a, a new administration comes, for example, after Trump, after Obama, the Trump administration changed everything. They actually uh, banned the use of climate change in, in these uh, agencies. So now Biden administration is changing that. But... When the priorities change, as a result, the, the, the evaluations change, but our models are flexible as you can uh, incorporate these different scenarios and look at what the, the, the final decisions would be. Now, continuing on this, uh, recently we looked at the uh, market diffusion potential assessment of such 
technologies. Again, we're talking about energy efficiency. And uh, one of my former uh, doctoral students, uh, Dr. Momtash Kana, worked on this. She is now working at a local uh, software company. Uh, and uh, and prior, the former uh, study also, uh, Dr. Ishkin is working in a software company, a data scientist. Now, uh, energy efficiency technologies, uh, of course, as I mentioned, help reduce the demand in energy and, and has several positive implications. However, we have to make sure that the, uh, the ecosystem is ready for them. So our objective is to evaluate the readiness of this. So the technologies for this uh, case we looked at uh, include like ductless heat pump water heater, solar water heater, or tankless gas water heater. Now, you might actually be surprised to see some of these because some of these are really uh, technologies that has been used uh, for decades in Turkey, uh, but they are new in the U.S. Uh, I mean, the U.S. lifestyle is changing because of uh, the the the necessity to to to uh, save energy for example tanks what tankless gas water heater is is what we know as shock pen in turkey but it's it's a new technology here believe it or not all right so uh by working with the experts we actually have again uh, have a similar model as you can see uh, uh, the uh, perspectives change including technological economic and, and legal aspects and others. And we quantify the, the model and then use our desirability curves and, and, and evaluate the technologies, come up with their values. Now, let me take a moment to explain what I mean with desirability curves. So this is like a, a good example is uh, about uh, uh, the value of a hamburger when you are hungry. So there's a, a, a certain value, right? When you're hungry and if you like burgers, there's a value of that. But the value of two hamburgers may not be equal to two times the value of one hamburger because after eating the first one, I mean, you may actually be full. And in that uh, logic, the value of 10 hamburgers is not really equal to 10 times the value of one hamburger for you because even if you're very hungry after the second or third, you'll be full. So you don't. There's no value. So that's that's what we are trying to capture with these desirable to, uh, curves. So after what uh, basically uh, level, the uh, the increase in in value of that uh, specific cr criterion does not have value for us, right? So your car can. I mean, if your car can go 200 kilometers per hour, that's great, but if it go if it's going 1,000 kilometers per hour, so the difference between 200 and 1,000 really doesn't mean anything for you because you're not going to be able to drive that fast anywhere anyway. So now using our uh, approach, we we calculate the the, the values uh, of these uh, technologies, and what these tells us. So for example, 14.88 out of 100 tells us that there's almost 85 percent of improvement. Now, how can we use that? So we basically go back to these desirability curves and understand uh, how we can increase in those and what we need to do. For example, here for ductless heat water heater, if we focus on levelized cost of electricity, accessibility, and energy price, and if we find ways to uh, uh, increase the value by reducing the uh, levelized cost of electricity, increasing accessibility and and uh, le basically decreasing the impact of energy price, we could uh, uh, increase the value uh, of the, uh, the this technology by almost nine percent. So this these these uh, approaches help us really to understand where we can improve the value of these technologies. Now, Similarly, uh, another recent uh, work uh, looked at wind technology, and uh, Dr. Abu Taha, Rimal Abu Taha, worked on this. She is currently a professor in Saudi Arabia, and what we did was we looked at uh, retrospectively the uh, the adoption of wind energy in the Northwest, and then looked at the policy tools, and for example, 
uh, tax credits or so, how it helped to uh, adopt to improve the adoption of this technology. Now, similarly, we again have at this level like economic, social, political perspectives, and underneath actions that will impact this perspective, which as a result will impact the adoption, will increase the adoption of such technology. So when we go and did our analyses, uh, we have seen economic feasibility improvement was the top uh, perspective that was impacting the adoption. And then when we looked at the tools and looked at them closer, we have seen that uh, you really need to uh, work on regulations, incentives, and standards at the same level so that a technology can be adopted uh, in a region, a major technology. So we also ran some scenarios and were able to see, I mean, in different scenarios, similar technologies were coming up uh, as most important. Uh, so uh, the model and, and, and our choices were robust. That was kind of the conclusion out of this. Now, uh, working on energy, right, uh, and the evaluating uh, R&D projects is also important now uh what what do you mean what do we mean with rnd project evaluation so there are a lot of uh when we started working with the uh, energy sector here we helped them to build technology roadmaps and the agencies here then uh, sought uh, rnd proposals to help them uh, to address the gaps in the technology roadmaps uh, so this model helps uh, basically builds uh, an evaluation model for uh, these R&D projects. Now, you could say that we, there's been a lot of uh, uh, similar models in the literature going back to decades, going back decades. But in this case, we were looking at a different business model. These were uh, government agencies uh, and nonprofit uh, uh, power utilities so their uh, focus was really different. So we basically built this model, uh, which had uh, uh, technical market organizational uh, and economic, uh, as well as uh, external relation, environmental uh, perspectives, very, sim very similar perspectives, but their weights were different in this case, of course. And the sub criteria were different. So we looked at, in this, time, in this case, we didn't use uh, value uh, model, but we we basically uh, use pairwise comparisons at the lower level as we in the other levels, and and and co uh, co uh, calculate the value uh, the the importance of these technologies through comparisons. Now, evaluating these R and D projects and and funding them and and having them developed is not enough, right? So the next thing, when the technology is ready, you have to transfer them. However, there's been a lot of uh, challenges. Now, uh, I forgot to mention in the prior model, sorry, going back, this model was developed by, again, one of my former students, uh, uh, Dr. Edwin Garces. And uh, he also uh, is an economist and electrical engineer, so he was able to understand the, the concepts here well. Now, the next one uh, was uh, conducted by Dr. Judith Estep. Uh, she's currently actually the Chief you know, uh, Technology Innovation Officer of Bonneville Power Administration, with, with which we worked uh, uh, over the years. Uh, and she looked at uh, the technology transfer assessment of these proposals that, we, that Edwin looked at for overall evaluation, because uh, they had difficulties in in transferring them after they were developed. So the idea here, we developed a, a score for these proposals so that we could understand the readin technology transfer readiness uh, or potential when the proposal was proposed so that we could go back and give them uh, feedback to improve the, the, the situation so that when the technology is developed, it can be transferred easily. So we just, uh, again, through the same mathematical models, we identified, in this case, of course, market perspective was important, uh, as well as 
things such as technical stakeholder complexities, project meetings, and so on and so forth. And then we looked at technologies such as uh, energy storage for demand management. So these are huge batteries or uh, using heat pump uh, water heaters for storing technology or, or the management of refrigerators in grocery stores. Now, uh, by looking again, evaluating these, we were able to identify uh, how these can be improved. So these are the values you can see on this page. And then these, uh, how we can improve each proposal so that uh, we can see improvements ranging uh, from 24% to 33% by just changing a few of the metrics, by improving a few of the uh, metrics here. Now, in addition to proposal, meaning the, and then who's proposing it uh, and, and how technology is developed, the, the, the organizations also have uh, a stake in uh, whether or not uh, the technology can be transferred easily, right? So we, uh, the next one looked at the, uh, to de develop a, a, a metric to assess the organization's technology transfer capability. So we were this time focusing on the organization instead of a technology. And uh, on this one, uh, Joe, Dr. Joe Lavoy worked on this one. He is currently working for uh, Daimler Corporation here in, the, in Portland. And he was one of my former students. And he uh, started working at Bonneville the day, when the day he came to work for me and worked there through the day he graduated. So we, and then he, his focus area was technology transfer process. So he was tasked with developing that. So he was, uh, we, we are able to use what's called action research to really observe everything in the organization. And as a result, identify uh, several criteria uh, through that, just being in the organization, being, being there uh, and working uh, actively, in addition to identifying them from the literature. So similar, like in the other models, working with the experts, we identified the weights and then developed uh, the uh, uh, value curves and then came up with a score for, uh, uh, for, the, for this agency. So as you can see, there is almost 68% uh, uh, improvement uh, or basically uh, opportunities. And by looking at different, uh, a few uh, sub, sub criteria or uh, metrics, we were able to make suggestions to increase the score up to almost 33%, uh, almost 100%. Now, uh, the next one, and, and let me know if I am running out of time. Uh, yeah, the, the, the ant, ant part of your presentation, hopefully. Okay, so how many, you have five minutes ten, or so left? Ten, ten minutes. Okay, so okay, so I'll, I have enough, enough time then. Okay. So this time, uh, funded by, again, several agencies, this time we looked at robotics technologies and these are technologies like these i don't really have every uh, information here because some of the information was confidential but uh, to give you an idea about what they are these are technologies uh, that are uh, to be used in the energy sector uh, for example snake robot that a robot can go into areas where men cannot or a person cannot go in uh, like in in uh, nuclear reactors, in in the uh, submarine nuclear uh, reactors, and so on and so forth, uh, or uh, wire robots for uh, transmission wires, uh, or uh, uh, the wall crawling robots for like dams, or submersible robots for again the the uh, the dams, right? So uh, the question was, uh, which technologies have the most value for the energy sector? And this came from what's uh, uh, called EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, which is the uh, consortium for all the power utilities in the, in the US. So uh, just a quick note here uh, on finding the experts. We generally go to experts through our, the agencies we work with, we find them. And in addition, we, we also do bibliometrics research, uh, look at all the papers and patents 
and who wrote them, who applied for them, and then uh, run what's called a social network analysis to find which uh, authors are cited more than the others or which authors work with many and then co and connect different uh, basically areas and in that way identify most important people uh, like in this case uh, here is an example so we can go to them and and work with them to quantify our models now for dissertations this is what we do but uh, these models can are actually are used heavily in the consulting business in the US and uh, those companies consulting to state agencies the federal agencies and departments as well as military uh, which are uh, tasked with making decisions and these are billion uh, some uh, dollar uh, decisions and they actually uh, use these models to to to justify their investments to the public and and and of course uh, there are several consulting companies profiting a lot from using these models because they actually uh, when they have a model they can a general a generalizable model they use it from one agency to another uh, and and in that way they use a model for for many many times Anyway, in this case, uh, this time, of course, we were not looking at, uh, uh, we were looking at really different perspectives, as you can see, working with experts. We went through, identified the desirability curves, and then calculated the values, as you can see here. Now, but these values were valid at the time when we did the assessments, right? Now, one of the other approaches developed at PSU by Kokaglu and Gertzri. Gertzri was at the time a Kokaglu uh, student, and he is currently in, in Thailand, a professor. And what he did was he looked at how these values will change into the future. So by working with the experts who are working on these technologies, we were able to understand when the technology will reach different values technically or, or economically and then we were able to come up with what's called technology development envelopes for these technologies now as you can see a technology low which is valued lowest will be uh, valued similar in about uh, seven years similar to the other technology so what this tells to the executives is that if they can uh, accelerate the development of this technology they can actually uh, have the value sooner. So uh, these assessments help decision makers to really understand how their investments can change. Now, of course, uh, scenarios will also help us to see what will happen if our priorities change. So we, when if we do that, we can see that the values and how they change over time changes. And all these assessments really uh, give the decision makers uh, brainstorming uh, opportunities for their decisions. Uh, Hujam, oh. I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, on time. Yeah, so with that, uh, what I really want to emphasize is that uh, energy is not a technical as uh, phenomenon, right? There are multiple perspectives ranging from political, social, environmental to legal. And uh, so they, without understanding them, you can make uh, a, a catastrophic, uh, uh, you, your decisions can basically end in catastrophic failures. Uh, the models we are working can be built at corporate uh, from, I mean, or regional levels, government levels. And the most important is these exercises help uh, communication. As a result, help build consensus. And, and reach an agreed upon plan uh, and and uh, and improves really the decision making of organizations so <clears throat> with that uh, i'll yield back to you thank you thank you for a uh, for very efficient such an efficient presentation so shall we uh, shall we continue in english or turkish which one would you like would you prefer well, English is better because we're going to talk about the topic, I believe so. <laughs> okay, so we have some questions. Uh, one of them is, um, these technologies developed in USA is uh, prototype status or uh, currently used? One of the questions. 
Well, uh, yeah, they, they, some of them, the proposals were building prototypes initially. And uh, really, the development of many of these started more than a decade ago. Now, all these technologies are deployed at uh, uh, utilities, like as battery uh, batteries or uh, like heat pump water eaters are being used all everywhere uh, in the in the northwest us uh, however uh, the uh, these technologies for example heat pump water heaters and whatnot were already developed and used in europe and and japan uh, so there wasn't really emphasis on po saving power in the us uh, up until a, a decade ago uh, and because of the uh, challenges in the grid here uh there was an emphasis especially in the northwest and and and uh, with the obama administration there was a lot of emphasis on on renewable energy so uh we have seen really uh adoption adaptation of these technologies in the us uh and battery technologies were mostly uh, new development uh, and it's still going on uh today mostly uh, for uh, electric vehicles. However, of course, uh, change in administration, the tr going to Trump administration, hampered many of these activities and uh, stopped the activities. And uh, as a result, uh, we recently have another catastrophe here in the US, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the, the events in Texas and, and uh, not being ready for a winter. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, unfortunately as you can see uh, the change political changes impact these decisions uh, i mean technically you would have I been see. ready but politically it impacted that i see thank you well, another question is that uh, of course rnd is quite important in this area as well so um, and also it is a large budget so that's why how do government encourage sustainable energy technology companies or state? Uh, does government or state encourage the companies to develop uh, innovative products in, in this area? Okay, so <clears throat> that's a, actually a very, very uh, good question, but I can talk hours on that. Now, <laughs> let me give you a shorter answer. So in the US, uh, the, the the the system works in a way that there is three major players: the universities, government, and the industry. And uh, we see, for example, a lot of major technologies coming out of national labs, like computers, internet, came out of really national labs initially. And when you look at the the the investment, uh, this country spends about a trillion dollars on military every year. Uh, give or take and that money is uh, invested into also a big portion we see invested into developing technologies for military which later on is transferred to the uh, civil sector now the the most efficient technology development of course is happening as a result in the industry but in the market driven private industry for example i used to work for intel and there you see extreme efficiency. Now, when you go to government, it's another story, okay? Uh, and we see inefficiencies. And when you go to the uh, energy sector, it's it's worse because uh, in the power sector, electricity sector, a lot of the age, uh, uh, companies are or, or the industry or, or regions are regulated, meaning they have they have certain markets. They cannot grow or they cannot really uh, go after other markets. So as a result, they have uh, almost no motivation to, to, to invest into R&D. And that's the story of the power here in the uh, US, unfortunately. So as a result, government uh, was uh, encouraging these uh, activities. They were funding themselves. So the power agency here funded these technology developments so that th these can be adopt, I mean, developed and then adopted by the utilities here in the Northwest. Now, of course, uh, 
the investments are were not enough, frankly. For example, yeah. in the stimulus fund back in 2009 or so, when Obama Biden administration, remember after the 2008 uh, the financial crisis, the uh, the amount for energy was 50 billion dollars. Now you could say 50 billion dollars is a lot of money, yes. But frankly, just Intel Corporation, one company, uh, spends similar amount in a few in a, in a few years to build uh, fabs. I mean, each fab is worth sometimes up to ten billion dollars. Okay, so when you want to change something drastically, like energy, you have to put money where your mouth is. Fifty billion dollars is not enough. So. When you look at, for example, this country built the atomic bomb, Manhattan Project, and then uh, uh, worked on the going to the moon. When you combine $50 billion to the, the budget in 2009 versus what was spent to that, what was spent during the atomic bomb development, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. So meaning we have to really put a lot of more than almost trillion dollars if you want to change our energy scene right uh, for example another example is electric cars so it's great i mean it's efficient but it doesn't make sense saying that oh we're gonna have electric cars so we're we're basically not impacting the the the air or or we're uh, the, the greenhouse gases and, and climate change if electric power is generated with foil, I mean, with uh, basically fossil fuels, right? If if oil and natural gas is used to generate the electricity, doesn't matter if you use electric car or fuel car, you're still at the end, when you look at the whole cycle, you're still using fossil fuel. So you have to change everything, right? The power needs to be, uh, renewable or nuclear, right? So that's another point. For example, we made politicians make decisions again, like I said, through all these multiple using all these multiple perspectives. And one of the most important perspective for them is political. So mm -hmm. because politicians uh, want to be reelected. So when the the catastrophe in Japan happened. Uh, the the nuclear reactor and then I mean tsunami and then the nuclear, nuclear reactor and so on and so forth. A lot of companies stopped building nuclear plants. But when you look at it, nuclear technology is the most efficient technology in terms of they have they it has the highest power density. So the the catastrophes occurred because of bad management of them. So if you mm -hmm. manage the technology, technology is safe. And today there are a lot of technologies that enabled use of uh, uh, fuel, which is which basically has much less high uh, half life. So as a result, you you get rid of the the, the uh, what do you call the the nuclear asp aspects of it in in less time. But if you manage it well. Uh, again, nuclear technology is, is uh, at, from that perspective, is the best. It doesn't have any greenhouse gas impacts too. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I mean, again, we talk about renewable energy, uh, green, uh, solar, and wind, but they are intermittent technologies too, right? So, without battery, efficient battery technologies, we still need to have uh, either rely on uh, natural gas or nuclear. Uh, so. Uh, at the end of the day, unfortunately, uh, because of the multiple uh, perspectives at play, uh, we we cannot have sustainable energy policies. So we still have to do what we have to do. But if the if the governments do not interfere and make sus substantial investments, uh, we may never see uh, this future sustainable future short-term uh, decisions will not really help us get there yeah, thank you for your answer it was very satisfied so uh, the last question is from my close friend 
one of my friend asks about what is the next what is the future of developing innovative energy technologies so the problem is i mean technologies are there right uh, the important thing is to use them mm. uh, how can we enable our uh, basically uh, how can we enable ourselves so that we switch to new technology we use uh, energy and stop climate change right uh, and we can do it through all different perspectives and not just one perspective okay and of course governments need to get together to do that uh, they need to work on on how i mean using uh, fossil fuels or stopping using them is not realistic given the economics right but we should focus also take on technologies capturing carbon out of them right so that it doesn't impact uh, cl climate change uh, uh, so emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence is gonna help us uh, use these uh, you I mean, be more smart about energy so we should be doing that uh, but again I think uh, it's not just a technical uh, decision or technical phenomenon like I said it's we have to focus on political aspects we have to focus on poverty uh, because when, yeah I mean, if, exactly if also when somebody doesn't have enough food to eat they will not care about what how they warm up okay okay thank uh, you so it's it's not a it's not an easy thing to do so in energy I think it's not about technology, but it's man about managing technology and understanding the perspectives. But in terms of uh, in uh, technologies, I think we're getting smarter thanks to AI, and we're going to see more of that. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, IoT we, usually in Turkey usually we are still on working on IoT technologies uh, on everything, Internet of Things technologies. Yeah, but we again we should be careful in not focusing on technology but understand humans yeah. uh, so we for example uh, thanks to technology we, we we survived covid pandemic right we were able to work from home and i'm able to do this now uh, but it it it really cut our social socialization right so we are social uh, beings uh, so Will we be able to go back to that? We will see, right? Uh, uh, but I think uh, we have seen how we can use technology. Uh, and uh, for example, we can do this today, right? So we, uh, in the past, uh, we weren't doing these, although we had the technology. So uh, I think uh, we're, go we're gonna see a lot of uh, the, uh, a lot of the things we learned through the pandemic transfer to our lives in the future. Thank you. So, Professor Daim, thank you for a nice presentation and contribution. Uh, our watchers are uh, still watching with a nice interest. So, and on behalf of all the watchers, I would like to thank you so much uh, for your contribution to my channel. So, uh, now time is close of all things for today's broadcasting. Thank you. Thank you. So Let's see you to uh, Turkish. E, değerli izleyiciler, bugün e, Amerika'ya bağlandık. Gördüğünüz gibi e, bizim için akşam e, orası için bulunduğu Oregon e, bölgesi için sabah saat kaç bilmiyorum ama daha galiba saat 10. <gülüyor> sabah saat 10 gibi e, Turul Hoca yeni kalktı. Eksiko olması bizi kırmadı. E, ve e, biz bu yayını gerçekleştirdik. Umarım e, hepinize, e, tüm izleyenlere e, ve izleyecek olanlara e, katkısı olur e, diye düşünüyoruz. Çünkü ben e, bu söyleşileri, bu webinarları e, sizlere e, vizyon kazandırmak için, fikir üretmenize destek olması için e, yapıyorum. E, ve bir tema üzerindeki en iyileri e, bularak, davet ederek gördüğünüz gibi e, mümkün olduğu kadar detaylı anlayabiliyoruz. E, 
incelemeye çalışıyoruz bir saat içerisinde olduğu kadarıyla. Çok teşekkürler dinlediğiniz için. Bugünkü yayının sonuna geldik. E, haftaya buluşmak üzere diye e, size e, iyi günler, izleyenlere de iyi akşamlar diliyorum. Hoşçakalın. Görüşmek üzere. Hocam hoşçakalın. Ne oldu?